I'm Rhonda Williams, and I'm the executive director of M Seminars. We're here today for a, a seminar on international students, what you should know, what they should know, what they don't know, all the strategies that uh, they might need to know. So we have three fantastic speakers here today, and that's Robin Jones, RCIC, and Rohin Bourdram, I hope I'm saying that correctly, yeah. <laughs> and Catherine Sass. And they're all going to take uh, different sections of the seminar to talk to you today. We'd also like to thank our sponsor, uh, Canada College Vancouver. We're in their lovely classroom again today, and we really appreciate it. So take it away, ladies. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone. For those of you who are here in person as well as those of you who are joining us virtually, as Rhonda kindly introduced us, my, my name is Rohin Bajram. To my right is Catherine Sass and also Robin Jones. We're going to be the trio who's going to take you through three specific sections today. The first, I will cover studying in Canada. And so what we ask is if you could hold your questions for that specific section, and then we'll try to, within the 45 minutes that we're going to allocate, be able to dissect that section as much as possible. And then Robin will take over the section in terms of working while studying. And then Catherine will sort of end us off with the pathways to permanent residence. And we're hoping that we give at least 15 to 20 minutes at the end for any questions or any um, sort of burning desires that we wanted to table and park at the end of the session. So let's start off with uh, studying in Canada. And we wanted to first highlight that we're framing this particular presentation in, in a way as far as us being able to discuss best practices to support international students as your clients, as potentially students if you work at educational institutions. So we're not going to necessarily be able to cover every single aspect of studying or working or certainly um, applying to permanent residence, but be able to hopefully leave some room for us to discuss some higher level policies, directions, and then uh, you'll see at the, each of the different sections we'll have some ethical considerations for us to consider. So we can only do so much in three hours, but we're hoping it will be a healthy time and certainly give us some time to debate some of the policies that come up. So with regard to studying in Canada, maybe we'll do a bit of a, a roll call, and, and, and this will be for those who are in person, and we'll see if we can find out uh, those who are joining us virtually, if we can ask the similar question. So the, the first question we have for you is, how many of you actually work with international students currently? Um, okay, a number. <laughs> and so for those of you who didn't put their hands up in the room, um, is, is it a client base that you're thinking of working with? Yeah? Okay, I'm seeing nods. All right. Um, and Randy, let us know if there are any comments that come up. Thank you for those in perfect virtually. So international students. Um, often we hear, oh, I love to work with international students. Uh, it's relatively easy to work with them. And, and I think as you start to work closely, for those of you who have put up your hand, you'll start to realize that uh, they're not as easy as they appear to be, in part because there's all these different nuances and different policies that govern almost every aspect of their time here in Canada. And you'll see when we talk a little bit more about what the study permit requires, what working entails, and we start to sort of go deeper and deeper in terms of policy, we start to realize that there is actually some great facilitative ways of them being able to do those things, some conditions that they have to comply with, and then in some cases, some restrictions or ambiguity. So they, don't as pe they may appear as an easy clientele, but you may find that that not, is not necessarily the case. Now, I do know colleagues will say to me, well, you haven't dealt with permanent residents, so I do understand that if you compare them to other clients, then that can certainly be a little bit different. So depending on the type of international student you work with, uh, you'll find that there are different policies or different um, things to take into consideration. For example, if you're working with minors, you'll likely find that you need to consider things like custodianship um, and what that entails, the obligations of that, uh, what they're allowed to do as far as a study permit, which is not tied to being able to work. Whereas when you work with students at the post-secondary level, you will likely find that there are maybe um, options for them to be able to work, 
but there are some eligibility criteria and some hours that they are restricted to. And I don't want to go into too much detail as far as work because I know Robin will be covering that in depth, but I did want to highlight that. And so out of curiosity, for those of you who put your hand up saying, yes, I do work with international students, the question that I have for you is, do you get to see a client right from the beginning, so from the initial study permit all the way through to PR? Okay, so I'm seeing, I'm seeing some people say no, and I'm, some, I'm seeing some people say yes. So for those of you who say yes, can you, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, I'm going to use the microphone. All right. So that people on the so I work in a graduate program at UBC and I'm involved in admissions so I'm helping those students now with um, study permit issues mm -hmm. and then they're admitted into our program and I've seen students through to their PhD and now some of them are attempting to apply for PR. Great, okay. And, and, are you, and you're certified as an immigration consultant? As of January, yes. As of January, okay, great. Excellent. Okay, so it sounds like few of us are able to see students right from the beginning when they're interested in coming to Canada all the way through to PR, uh, whereas a uh, majority of us don't get to see that. And that is, that's quite common. It's a luxury, I think, to be able to see a student right from the beginning all the way through the end. And in many ways, it's rewarding to be able to see them through that journey. The reason why I highlight that is because if we don't have that luxury, that means students come to us at different points, whether it's their initial study permit, and they want to know how to prepare a strong application, or they come to us after they've been refused, and now we need to figure out why this occurred, or they've done everything within their power to be able to set themselves up to apply for PR, but now they're asking us what, what's next. And I know Catherine will discuss that in more depth. So we don't always have that, that ability to be with students right from the beginning. But we do want to start off with how do we navigate supporting international students? And the first one is to better understand their long-term goals. Whether you are working with students who are outside of Canada, who are wanting to come and study, um, we often hear from them, yes, I want to come and study. It, you know, in Canada, it has a very strong education brand. We have over 400 and uh, I think the, the latest figure was 459,000 international students which if you're, sh if you're right now following the national international education strategy here in Canada, which was introduced in 2012, the target for t by 2022 was to have 450,000 international students registered. And we've already surpassed that. And we're not even five years away from that target. So what that means for international students is, I want to come to Canada, I want to study, my academic program is here, but then I also want to stay. Right? And so that intention to stay long term in some cases for some students is a nice to have and yeah, I'm thinking about it. Or in other cases, it's a prominent dual intent and students are interested in that. And it's important for us to know that ahead of time so that we can then tell students what that would look like, not only in their application submission, but also what they can do during their time in Canada to maximize the time that they have here with us. And so in recognition of that, it's important for us to, as I think as a profession, but also as immigration uh, consultants and lawyers, is to be able to then allow students to understand what that, what that might entail in terms of work permits and permanent residence pathways. So in many ways, we wanted to start off with saying that you know, staying in Canada is an excellent opportunity, but we want students to be aware of how to um, how to ensure that they have uh, appropriate sort of, how do they ensure that they have a great time here studying, but also be able to set, them out to set themselves up to succeed post-graduation. So let's start off with uh, DLIs, because I think DLIs are always important for us to recognize. So with designated learning institutions, this uh, came about in Jan, sorry, June 1st, 2014, with changes to the International Student Program whereby IRCC essentially, um, as per Regulation 211, indicated that any schools at the K-12 level were automatically designated. And so they didn't have to go through this um, partnership or signing process with provinces and territories. However, DLIs or institutions at the post-secondary level do have to be 
uh, designated by virtue of signing an MOU with the province um, or the territory in which they're located in.